The image that we see here shows us the classification of prokaryotic organisms. Prokaryotes are divided into two main domains. We have bacteria and then also archaea. And if you just look at the numbers here, we can see that the bacteria are much more abundant. We have many more phyla than the archaea group. The focus here is going to be on classifying the bacteria, and we're going to talk about the um, different phyla that they are divided up into. Ultimately, we do have 24 different groups, and we're just going to focus on the ones that are the most common and have the greatest impact on humans. So the first group that we're going to discuss are the deeply branching bacteria. They are called deeply branching bacteria because these are thought to be similar to the earliest evolving bacteria. Because of that, these are autotrophic. They are able to basically make their own carbon sources or organic molecules. That would have definitely been necessary if these were some of the first evolving organisms because there would not have been other organisms to produce the food for them. These also live in habitats that are thought to be very similar to what the early Earth environment would have been like. If we look at some example bacteria that fall within this deeply branching group, Aquifex is going to be one of them. Aquifex has some members that are chemiototrophic. That means that they're autotrophs, but they get their energy from chemicals. We have some that are hypothermophilic. That means that they grow at extremely high temperatures or they survive at extremely high temperatures. And then we have some that are microaerophilic, which means that they can grow in the presence and survive in the presence of oxygen, but they require really low oxygen levels, which probably is what we had in the early Earth atmosphere. Another group is this one here, the Deinococcus. These are extremely resistant to radiation and their cytoplasm contains high amounts of manganese, which probably helps with this and helps them to survive that high radiation. Um, in that case, it's actually helping them to repair damage that's caused by radiation. Another bacterial group or subdivision is what we call the phototrophic bacteria. These phototrophic bacteria get their energy from light. They're going to absorb light using pigments in thylakoids called photosynthetic lamellae. There are thylakoids in chloroplast, but these are going to be different because we don't have chloroplast when we're talking about prokaryotic cells like bacteria. Chloroplast would be one of those membrane-bound organelles. So the thylakoids in this case, they do have a different name, and that's where we're going to find the pigments. We have five different groups of phototrophic bacteria. We've got blue-green bacteria, green sulfur bacteria, green non-sulfur bacteria, purple sulfur, and then also purple non-sulfur. So let's go through and let's talk about some of these. We're going to talk first about the blue-green bacteria, or what we call the phylum cyanobacteria. For this phylum, um, these are called blue-green bacteria, and a lot of that is because of the pigments that we do see present in them. These used to be called blue-green algae because they had some characteristics that were similar to plants. These are gram-negative autotrophs, so they have a gram-negative cell wall around them, and they are autotrophs, so they are able to produce their own organic molecules. They are going to utilize chlorophyll A and generate oxygen during photosynthesis. So those are characteristics that will be similar to plants. In fact, these are thought to have been responsible for early oxygenation of the Earth's atmosphere, so basically producing a lot of that initial oxygen that did enter the atmosphere, and these are thought to have evolved really into the first chloroplast. So one of these cyanobacterium is thought to have been one of the cells that was kind of swallowed up using that endosymbiosis theory, and over time, um, this did evolve into a chloroplast in what we now look at as eukaryotic cells. Some of the cells that we do have in this cyanobacteria group, they are able to perform nitrogen fixation. And if we look at some of the cells that do that, um, the heterocyst right here is a cell that is involved in nitrogen fixation. And it is a special cell. It does look different from the other surrounding cells. The production of oxygen, which happens during photosynthesis, does interfere with nitrogen fixation. So we do have separate cells that perform photosynthesis, and then we will have other cells called heterocyst here that look different. They have a thick cell wall around them, and they will perform that nitrogen fixation process. If we look at the green and purple phototrophic bacteria, 
These are going to use bacterial chlorophylls for photosynthesis. So they have a different pigment that they're using in their thylakoids for photosynthesis, and they do not generate oxygen during photosynthesis. So we call them anoxygenic. So different pigments and the fact that they don't generate oxygen would be things that separate these out and make them different from those blue-green bacteria. These are typically going to be found in anaerobic mud environments. So this would be um, a lot of times around um, some ponds and lakes, so deep in the mud that you do have surrounding those environments. If we talk about sulfur bacteria versus non-sulfur bacteria, because we have green ones that are sulfur, we have green non-sulfur, we have purple sulfur and purple non-sulfur. So if we um, talk about the sulfur ones first, Sulfur bacteria are going to obtain their needed electrons from hydrogen sulfide. That means that they are capable of oxidizing hydrogen sulfide. The non-sulfur bacteria, they are going to obtain their needed electrons by oxidizing organic molecules. We have a big group of bacteria that we call the low GC gram-positive bacteria. So these are gram-positive bacteria but they are kind of lumped together because if we look at their DNA composition and their DNA has four bases in it, A, T, C, and G, if we just look at the percentage of G and C that they have, they all have very similar ones. These are going to be bacteria that have a GC content of less than 50%. So less than 50% GC, which means the A and the T are above 50%. Um, one of the phylums that we have in here is this one right here, Firmicutes. Um, if we talk about some example bacteria that we have in this phylum, um, Clostridia is one of them. Clostridia has a rod shape to it. These are obligate anaerobes for the most part, and these do have the capability to form endospores. And anything that can form endospores is something that is um, difficult for humans to actually treat because these are able to survive under those harsh conditions. Um, these are responsible for causing tetanus, gangrene, and then also botulism. So they do have significant impacts on humans. Another group that falls into this phylum is the mycoplasmas. Mycoplasmas are unique because they do not have cell walls, which is unusual for bacteria. The mycoplasmas are either facultative anaerobes, meaning they can live without oxygen or they can live in the presence of oxygen, or they can be obligate anaerobes, meaning that they don't survive at all in the presence of oxygen. So they must be in um, environments that don't have any oxygen gas. These tend to colonize mucous membranes of the respiratory and urinary tracts. And if we look at a microscope image of them, they tend to look like um, basically an egg that has been broken open. So you can see how we do have dark spots inside of there. If we talk about some other low GC um, gram-positive bacteria, one of the large groups that we do find within here are the bacillus. Bacillus do tend to form endospores. That is what we're seeing in this microscope image here. They are the green cells, so they've been specifically stained to allow us to see the endospores. And then bacillus also tend to move by peritrichous flagella. That means lots of flagella on the surface of the cells. One of the commercial importances of bacillus for us is the fact that they do produce Bt toxin. This is basically an insecticide and many crop plants have been genetically engineered to produce that Bt toxin, which means that we do not necessarily have to spray insecticide on them because they kind of make that insecticide themselves. This can also be applied commercially to crops. One of the negative things um, for us as humans that has to do with bacillus is that this does cause anthrax, which is a very serious illness. Another group is listeria. Listeria, um, it has commercial importance because this one continues to reproduce even with refrigeration. So that means that it can continue to survive in food and it can contaminate milk and meat and this can cause meningitis. So that is a serious health concern when we're talking about listeria. If we talk about a positive one, lactobacillus falls into that category. Lactobacillus is able to protect our body using microbial antagonism. So it's basically fighting off other microbes. Um, this one is used in the production of yogurt, buttermilk, 
pickles. If you actually look at some of your um, yogurt labels, it will tell you on there that it does contain live cultures of lactobacillus. So this is one that does have positive benefits for us. And then just some other ones, we have streptococcus, enterococcus, staphylococcus, all of those fall into this low GC gram positive bacteria group. And these are ones that are um, responsible for causing numerous human diseases. If we talk now about the bacteria that group into the high GC gram positive bacteria, these are going to be bacteria that have a GC content of above 50%. There is a lot of diversity in this group as well. Um, phylum actinobacteria does fall into this group. And these tend to be rod-shaped cells and then also filamentous forms. So there is some variety to the shapes. This group right here is one of the representative members. These tend to produce pleomorphic cells. So pleomorphic means there's a variety of shapes and sizes there. And then one thing that we do see a lot in this group is that they do reproduce by snapping division. So that's the variation on binary fission that does produce kind of a snap um, to the cells when they do start to separate. When these do reproduce by the snapping division, we tend to see V shapes, so where they're still attached, but they're connected together like this. And then we also have palisades, which is where they're gonna be just in a row. These are um, known for producing metachromatic granules, and that is the dark spots that we see in this picture right here and those granules are going to be inclusions of phosphate. So that is unusual for these and we can specifically stain them so that those metachromatic granules are very visible as you see right here. Mycobacterium is another group that falls under this category. These tend to form slightly curved to straight rods. They have a very slow growth. So that is one of the things that's unusual about them. It takes them a long time to divide. And these have cell walls that have very high concentrations of mycolytic acids. So that is one of the reasons why it's thought it does take them so long to divide. These will be stained specifically using acid fast stain so it can separate those out from um, other uh, bacteria that don't have those special cell walls. And these are responsible for causing tuberculosis and then also leprosy. The actinomycetes are going to be bacteria that are a little unusual because these happen to resemble fungi. We know that they're not fungi because they are not made up of eukaryotic cells and fungi are eukaryotic organisms. So although the actinomycetes look like fungi, they do have prokaryotic cells. They reproduce um, using reproductive spores that are located at the tips of their filaments. So this is a case where you have kind of parent cells that do produce offspring cells or spores. So we do have some groups of these that do cause um, some human disorders or they are human pathogens. These are known most commonly for causing abscesses. But besides the negative ones, we do have some that has, have positive roles as well. Um, these two that you see right here, Nocardia and then also Streptomyces, both of these have beneficial roles in the environment because they can degrade pollutants or they can recycle nutrients. So obviously those would be important environmental roles if we're talking about degrading things and recycling the nutrients from dead organisms. If we talk now about the gram-negative proteobacteria, this is known to be the largest, most diverse group of bacteria. Um, we divide these into five overall classes, which are based on the Greek alphabet. We have alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, and then we have the deltas, and then we also have the epsilons. So we'll go through now and talk about just general characteristics of each one of these bacterial groups. The first group that we'll talk about are the alpha proteobacteria. These are aerobes that are capable of growing at really low nutrient levels. So as long as they have oxygen present, they can still grow with low nutrients. One thing that's a little bit unusual about this group is that some of the members do have these unusual extensions, which we call prostheca. This is an outgrowth or an extension of the cytoplasm, and it is certainly surrounded by cell wall. You can see prostheca in this image here. Another thing that's a little different or unique about this group is that we do have some nitrogen fixers in this group. So there's two genera that fall into that. Um, rhizobium is what we're seeing in this particular image here. 
So nitrogen fixers are able to capture atmospheric nitrogen and turn that into a form that other organisms are able to use. So the most common use of it is going to be by plants. So we do see a lot of these growing in close association with plant roots. And that's what we're seeing in the image here. We get actual nodules formed on the plant roots and they grow in an association, a um, mutually beneficial association with plants. We also have some nitrifying bacteria in this group as well. And what we mean by nitrifying bacteria is that they perform nitrification. So that means that they are able to obtain electrons by oxidizing nitrogenous compounds. The beta proteobacteria, these are also bacteria that grow at very low nutrient levels. This does contain some of those nitrifying bacteria, so ones that can oxidize nitrogenous compounds. And this includes some pathogenic bacteria, such as the ones that cause gonorrhea, meningitis, and then also pertussis, which is whooping cough. If we talk about the gamma proteobacteria, this is the largest, most diverse group of proteobacteria. And there are a number of different subgroups that fall underneath here. So if we just talk about some general characteristics of each one of these subgroups, the purple sulfur bacteria, these are able to oxidize hydrogen sulfide into sulfur. So that's why we have the sulfur part in their name. These tend to be found in very sulfur rich locations. The intracellular pathogens, these are human pathogens and they thrive inside white blood cells. This um, Legionella is one example that is responsible for causing Legionnaire disease. We have some methane oxidizers. These use methane as their carbon source and also as their energy source. These tend to be found in anaerobic environments, so they tend to be found a lot of times in boggy type areas. The next group, the facultative anaerobes. Um, facultative anaerobes means they can survive in the absence of oxygen. These catabolize carbohydrates using glycolysis and then also the pentose phosphate pathway. So that's what the PPP stands for. If we look at an example of this group, the most common example is Escherichia coli. That is the long name for E. coli. So that is something that um, benefits us. We have naturally occurring E. coli versions inside of our bodies. And then we also have some that cause a variety of different illnesses. There are also versions of E. coli that are used a lot for recombinant DNA technology purposes. The pseudomonads, um, the last group that we have, these are flagellated rod-shaped bacteria. These are going to catabolize carbohydrates using another process. This is the inter deuteroff process along with the pentose phosphate pathway. The delta proteobacteria, um, these are going to include sulfate reducing bacteria, and these will be very important for recycling sulfur. So that is their environmental impact. Um, this particular one has a unique approach that it uses to attack and destroy other gram negative bacteria. This particular one actually drills in, physically drills into another bacterial cell. So in through its cell wall, it enters that cell and basically absorbs the nutrients from it. And once it does that, it grows into a long filament that you see here, and then that divides by fragmentation into some smaller cells which escape from the original cell that it did infect. So that's unusual. Another unusual one in this group is mixobacteria. Um, with these, they actually work together, multiple bacteria work together to form this um, special reproductive structure. So that's what we see right here. You get a clump of cells that is produced. They're able to rise up and produce what we call a fruiting body that rele releases some spores that can then move to another environment and grow and germinate. The last group of proteobacteria is the epsilon proteobacteria. Here we just have a couple members that we want to mention. Campylobacter is one. This one is responsible for causing blood poisoning. And then Helicobacter is one that is responsible for causing ulcers. Just a few last gram-negative bacteria that we do want to mention because they do have some significance to us. Um, the chlamydias. They are a group that lacks peptidoglycan, which again is unusual for bacterial cells. And one of the things that's also different about this group is that they do have to be cultured inside other cells. So these are not ones that we can just grow on their own on top of a petri dish surface. 
These have a number of human diseases that they do cause, and um, many of them are known for causing some blindness. Spirochetes, these have a long spiral shape to them, and these are unusual because they've got these special axial filaments that help them to produce kind of a corkscrew movement. The last group we're gonna talk about are the bacterioids. These are found in the digestive tracts of humans and animals, and the importance of these is that they are able to catabolize or break down some molecules which are typically indigestible by mammals. So by helping to break down those molecules, they're going to enhance the nutrients that that animal is able to extract.